everyone. Um, we've got Scott Coulton from Poppin. So um, just imagine all the containers that are at the moment at your work environment. And uh, Scott's going to tear them down for you. <laughs> so I'll hand you over. Hi, how's it going? Thanks, Sarah, uh, for coming out to my talk. There's some really good talks today, so thank you very much. Um, I will talk a little bit about myself. Um, I work for Poppet. Uh, I work in the cloud native team. Um, I predominantly work in Golang applications, uh, Kubernetes, ContainerD. Um, so not too much on Puppet server itself, but um, on a lot of other stuff we do in other places. Um, I'm a Docker captain. Uh, you can get me on GitHub and, and that. Uh, and sorry, GitHub and Twitter. Um, in this talk, what we're going to cover is, is it that easy to break out a, a container? I was at KubeCon EU, and people were like, oh, like, we can just break out the containers. Like, if you list, like, uh, uh, there's, like, the virtualization containers are saying, like, oh, if you run Docker, you can just break out of it. Like, use Carta containers. It's heaps better, right? It's virtualized. It's just a CRR plugin for it. Just use that. Um, and I'm like, is it that easy? Um, I'm a Linux kernel guy. I've worked on the runtime stuff, um, worked on Linux Kit, so building an OS with, and I'm like, is it that easy to really break out a container? It's like, like all these people are saying, like, we can just, you just break out, right? So you need like all these security tools, they'll sell you the world. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today, first of all, um, I'm gonna show you some reference architectures and say, is it that easy to break out? We'll talk through it. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about a whole heap of open source software or free stuff that's built in. Um, to either Kubernetes, Docker, um, or the Linux subsystems that you can use right now to protect yourself from breaking out of a container. So even if someone does like get into your act actual application inside the container, um, the chances of them escaping out into like any usable namespace it would be like extremely difficult. Um, so yeah, so we'll look at the risk. Um, we'll look at how to protect ourselves. Um, and I'll throw in a real-world application that we've built um, around like Linux, uh, Linux kernel and containers just to run Kubernetes on an ephemeral OS that we've built. Um, so that'll give us some good like, insight in how you can tie this all together. Um, before I start, nothing is unhackable. Um, there's new vulnerabilities coming out every day. Um, I just want to go through some reference architectures and, and stuff um, and see what you, what you think. Uh, so let's look at the risk. And as you can see here, my Draw.io skills are massively, this is why I get paid the big dollars. Um, luckily, my code's better than my Draw.io skills. Um, so this is the sample architecture we're going to look at, right? We're going to look at, we're running Nginx on a container. There's Docker running, and there's someone hitting the web service from port 80 by the internet. Nothing special, right? This is like pretty basic stuff. Um, so we'll assume this. We'll assume that Docker is the latest version. Um, we'll assume that we're using the latest tag on the web server. Now remember the latest tag, we're gonna keep coming back to this because this is one of the big things that you can get around um, people with, with latest because latest is a, like a time stamp. Um, if I get onto your box and pull latest again and then you try to run latest, latest is now not the latest you had, it's the latest I had. So you should never use latest, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, We'll talk about no volumes of mounted because like I've seen in some demos, people are like, well, we'll map the UIDs to root inside the container to the OS, we'll map ETC, oh look, I've popped out of the container. Um, well, yeah, kind of, but like that's like saying, well, you're on AWS, um, you're gonna leave 0.0.0, .0 backslash zero open to everyone and you're just gonna run anything there. And like, is that mean the cloud's insecure because you made a bad configuration choice, not so sure. Um, I mean, most of the vulnerabilities I've seen around containers, and this is actually uh, really topical, has been like user configuration issues. Uh, and if you have a look at our good prime minister today, I don't know if you know the story, um, but let his domain lapse and uh, his website now plays Scotty Doesn't Know at scottmorrison.com. Um, so there was nothing technical in that, right? There was no, they didn't pop this box, they didn't get into his website, they literally went, oh, look, the domain's running out, I'll buy that and I'll put this up. Um, but do you know what? The, the humiliation and, and everything that went along with it, it might as well have got hacked. Like, I mean, it's still like in the mainstream news, 
Uh, most people are not going to understand it. I mean, I found out about it because my wife like texted me and said, hey, have you seen this? You'll find it funny because one, it's Scotty doesn't know. Um, and two, it's like, I always like stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that's super funny. And she, she didn't even get like what the domain registration stuff is. But to her, it's like super funny that someone hacked the prime minister. And that's basically what comes out of it, right? Someone hacked the prime minister. But did they really know? Was it a configuration issue or someone not watching what they were doing? I would say more likely. Um, so that's why I'm going to say there's no volumes mounted, because like, I can do a whole talk about how to escape containers if volumes are mounted incorrectly, but we'll, we'll just say at the moment volumes are not mounted. Um, again, there's no remote access to the Docker API. Um, if you have remote access set up for the Docker API, so like I've seen this on like a lot of systems that people say, I'll uh, just have like your IP address and then port the port number, and it's open, oh, but there's no TLS or stuff. Um, you're sending a whole heap of stuff that then you probably can't break out of a container, but you definitely get um, root access to the box that way. Um, there's no default security policies being added to the running container. Um, so both Kubernetes and Docker um, ship with the same security policies. Um, they're super easy to turn on, um, but most people don't do it. Um, and like, you don't even have to write an app armor pro profile yourself. Um, because like I know a whole heap of people don't like to sit there writing set comp or app armor profiles, like it kind of sucks. Um, but there's some some stuff shipped there. So, but we haven't got that turned on. Um, another thing that I want to assume that Docker has been installed from its official repos. How many people know how many CVEs have been in Docker that's not actual Docker? Like um, talking about other implementations of Docker. So if you go like for example, I don't want to talk too bad about other vendors, but if you go yum install Docker engine and you get that from Red Hat, that's not Docker, that's Project Atomic. They've, got, they've had at least 11 CVEs um, against their version of Docker than Docker has from, if you go from the Docker repos, because of the way impl the implementation of system Ds and their franking kernels. Um, so did you guys know that? So not all packages are equal. Um, and if you're trying to look at like CVEs and like, and like there's been crazy stuff like you can like unmount from inside the container because of system D and their implementation of turning security features off. Um, and that's in Project Atomic. So there's whole GitHub um, issues about this. This is not secret stuff. Like if you follow um, Docker, there's been some pretty massive pull requests for, um, denied from Docker on security from the people at Red Hat. So it's not like I'm talking about something that's in behind, like this is all open information. Um, but yeah, it, not all, all runtimes are equal. So just, just be careful about that because if you are in an enterprise and you are following TVs and, and bits and pieces like that, then you want to make sure that you're following the right project, not just assuming that you're following upstream Docker and then there's CVEs out on, on somewhere else. So this is the attack, right? So I'm not going to go too much into it. We exploit the web server, there's something there. We find the un an underlying kernel vulnerability. We escape the container and now we're part of the Docker group, so we're as good as root. So that's it, right? That's, that's what people would leave you to believe. It's, it's, it's that easy, right? Um, how many people are pen testers here? A few. How how long do you think it would take, um, roughly, to find that not only that, that you could get into, like, say, Nginx, once you were in inside the container to find out there was a, a, a kernel vulnerability that you could unmount and then, or, or you could uh, maintain and then get out, how long, roughly, do you think that would take if you were doing exploration? I'm not a pen tester, so... I mean, there's a lot of things that would have to align there for you to be able to break out, is what I'm kind of saying. Um, so yeah, so looking at Alan, how hard, how hard would that be in practice? So like, there's a lot of things that need to line up there for you to get out of the container. So you, first of all, you need a vulnerability in the upstream application that you're running or in your code base. You need to then have a kernel level vulnerability that allows you to escape into the namespace. Um, the attack would be super easy for you though, if the UID is mapped to the OS. Um, so you'll find people, um, and some of the stuff, there's some, there's some really bad examples of this on Docker Hub, and I don't want to name and shame, but some people's application need root access to run, and they're inside their Docker files, they map. Um, and these are fairly big applications. Um, and yeah, the, the end user, if you just go Docker run uh, application X, we'll call it, um, you don't know that you're actually mapping, um, because you haven't, if you haven't looked at the Docker file, um, you haven't seen what, what's happening on the inside. So that's super important. Um, if the user is started with PID host or PID privilege, that is a problem. Because that's giving you um, underlying access to all the processes running on the OS. Now, there, 
there it was a pull request open in Docker to say, can you get rid of this? Um, but there are actually um, use cases for this. Um, one example is if you run kubelet in a container, um, you actually need dash dash privilege um, because you're using the underlying kernel to then run other containers and bits and pieces like that. Uh, I run on my um, computer here, I run htop in a container, and I use dash dash privilege um, because I want to see what the underlying OS is doing. So like, it is useful, right? In a production web application or something like that, probably not so useful. Um, and if people are mounting volumes wrong, that's going to be the biggest biggest way to escape. Um, and and I'm not even sure that if you you can fully escape this way, um, but it'll give you right access to the root OS of the OS, um, so you can make some some malicious changes. So like, just be careful of of, of mapping volumes. Um, but I, I haven't actually seen any like uh, heaps of real life attacks that, that have done this. Like I've seen a whole heap of research documentation where they were already in the in the box or they. But no one like I watched the the Q and A on security on the security panel in, in KubeCon, and people from Twistlock and a whole heap of people were talking. And there's like a whole heap of research being done about this and and that. But there hasn't been any like real life vulnerabilities, like real life exploits that um, someone's spoken about at least. Um, that, that someone's got in and escaped this way. Um, they've already, all the researchers, they've already had access to the box and a whole heap of other stuff. But this is a real life one. Um, if you are not watching what you're pulling from upstream, you will allow people to take control of your box. Um, so there, this, this actually happened the day that I was talking to uh, Dr. Front EU. Um, so a vulnerable image um, people were using, um, and that was then they weren't looking at the Docker file, they weren't looking at what was being mapped, they weren't looking at the volumes being mounted, and then people were escaping um, through like a backdoor basically that they wrote into this this container. Um, and it took a long time for this container to come down. I mean, this is August 7, 2017, that it was first reported on Docker Hub, and it got taken down in May 2018. Um, so, how many people? We're, we're using it in, in that time. Um, and it basically went down to um, like a memory test application. So it was basically like, hey, you're having issues with memory, like the, it said, you're having issues with memory inside your Docker file, just side mount this and like, we'll, we'll be able to do it and it's open source and it's free. Uh, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And the developer's gone, all right, I don't really, and the reason this really works well is because like, there's a whole new people, the heap of people that are going like, hey, I'm new to containers, I don't quite know what's happening. And they just want open source tools, right? So they're like not thinking about like what they're doing or the repercussions of their actions. They're just like, okay, memory test, how bad can it seem? Like it's got a lot of stars on Docker Hub. It's got a lot of downloads. Like it's not hard to write a bot to star or it's not a lot hard to write a bot to download a thing. It's a whole heap of times, but like that's what people look at. And I've, I've spoken to, to some really smart people and um, that don't know much about containers and that's what they look at. They look at stars and they look at downloads. And, that's not that easy. It's not that hard to fake that. So um, have a look at like if you're going to run something, or like my, my in my opinion, if you're going to run something from upstream, fork the Docker file, chuck it in your own repo, um, do some sort of analysis over it, and we'll, we'll start going into how you can do that later. So, but this is the more this is the most common way that someone's going to get into your your container runtime environment, because someone's going to download something that's vulnerable, and it's going to be self built to do a single uh, single attack. Um, and yeah, as I said, it's just blindly tr trusting upstream. Um, and I mean, even even some of the some of the things in Docker Hub library are vulnerable. Um, and all that information is freely available. So if you go to like Docker Hub, you look at a tag and then you can te um, test the vulnerability uh, scan of it. If it's in library, all that information is freely available to you. So you can actually find out if you're, the container is vulnerable before you even put anything in it. Um, which is which is super important as well. So, how do we protect ourselves? So, we actually get, we're actually going we're actually going to take that use case. Like, we can actually um, protect ourselves from that particular container. So, we're going to have a look at now that someone's written a, an exploit um, that your developer is going to use, and we're going to try to protect ourselves against it. Um, when we're talking about um, processes. Um, when we're talking about containers, we should be running a single process in a single container. Um, if you have a look at like 
people say, oh, I don't know if containers are secure compared to like an OS. Well, um, in the previous talk, we looked at how much code there is um, before you even in components before you even put your code in. Um, imagine an OS. An OS has got thousands of things, thousands and thousands of lines of code. Um, so how can you protect yourself against that? You have to, there's a whole way for tooling build around it. Um, in theory, protecting a single process should be easier than protecting more. It's just math. Um, so when, when, we're, when we're starting to look at containers, like there, there is a use case, with, and I have seen it, that people um, run fat containers. They're trying to like, um, modernize traditional apps, and there's a whole heap of stuff around that. Um, that's good. They obviously thought about this. They can take the risk. Um, but if, you're, if you want to be really securely focused, I would just use a, a single process inside a container. And we'll get to why that's important in a second. Um, but there's documentation um, being um, it's, it's out there about how to protect your engine and runtime. If you're not sure and you want to be like security minded and make sure um, and have same defaults for your Docker engine, have a look. It's all out there. Um, there's tooling built around a, a lot around this. Um, a good friend of mine used to work as the head of security at Docker, um, Diego, and he, he, his whole pur pur purpose there before he left was to get this all out there, make sure that people understood that it, you can use it securely. Um, they looked at a whole heap of stuff about rotating TLS and stuff. Is it some of the best stuff I've ever seen? But if you're just talking about the engine itself and the runtime, um, this has got all, everything that you need um, in it. So same configurations, how to protect the Docker API, how to protect the kernel from the um, OS, and how to protect unwanted processes in the container. Um, so it's a two-way street with containers. So like you're only as secure as your kernel. Um, you want to protect the kernel from the container and the container from the kernel. Um, and if you can do that, then you'll be fairly, fairly, um, uh, you'll be fairly successful. Um, some same defaults again. We're going back to PID hosts. We're going back to net hosts. If you're going to um, allow the, the OS networking stack to be loaded in the container, that could cause you issues if you don't understand what you're doing. Uh, if you bind any TCP port to 0.0.0, .0 that's going to be an issue. Um, if you don't use TLS for any of the traffic that you're sending over 0.0.0, .0 that as well is going to be an issue. Um, so yeah, and I've seen all these in, in, in production environments with people not understanding why um, this is a bad idea. Because like, the container wouldn't start without PID host. OK, why isn't it starting? Oh, the application hasn't got access. Yeah, but that's because you need too much access than, than you really need in the container. Um, there's a whole heap of stuff where you can rework that. Um, dash dash bid host will fix it straight away, first time, every time. But that's like saying, oh, I've got a firewall issue. I can't connect to this service outside. OK, we'll just open up to 0.0.0.0. .0 and would you do that on a firewall? Probably not. Um, why would you do it on a, on, with a processes on a container? Um, one of the new features that's going to be released in 1809, which is super cool, uh, SSH over uh, Docker daemon over SSH. So if you don't want to mess around with a whole heap of TLS stuff that's like actually quite messy to configure if you haven't done it, and self-signed certs and blah, 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 all that, and SSH keys seem to be like a lot easier. Um, this is actually in master now in Docker. It was merged. Um, it's coming out in 1809. Um, there's a really good blog, blog post got released yesterday about it um, if you want to look at it in more detail. Um, but if I was going to configure stuff and you needed some remote access, and like even for like build hosts and things like this, um, this is the way I would set it up. Um, because yeah, it'll just give you the best security profile with the least amount of work. Um, test your configs. So like just because there's a book out there and there's a CIS benchmark, um, and you've read it, and I mean, it's a, it's a cracking book. I'll take it home, get a bottle of wine, um, open, go through the pages. It's a brilliant read. It's not dry at all. Um, <laughs> but if you have actually done that and you enjoy that stuff, um, then test your configs. Run it daily. Run it um, nightly. Um, like you can, you can run this on the cron. You could use like configuration manager. You could have a container spin up to do it. You can. There's a whole heap of ways you can do this. Um, but you can get reporting on it, so you can see if there's been any drift, if there's been anything that you need that someone's gone in there. Um, depending on the access you have to underlying hosts, host, like I mean, a developer could have gone in and changed the settings so something works. 
Um, so don't, in, don't think that just because you ran it once when the machine was um, provisioned, um, that the, the configuration is exactly the same if you haven't got something enforcing it or rechecking it. Um, so yeah, so these tools are all open source again, and they're all free. So um, nothing that I'm talking about today will cost you a cent, um, which I think is super powerful. Um, if you know the only process is running, um, then apply AppArmor. I'm a Debian person, I need Ubuntu. Um, I use AppArmor, sorry, Red Hat people. Um, if you like Setcom, use Setcom. Um, but if you know what's running or what needs to run in the application, then only allow the container to have access to that. Um, so again, um, AppArmor is a, quite a dry read. Um, but you can see, you can see here. This is the this is just the um, generic one that comes with built into Docker. Um, but you can see here how it's got denying a whole heap of stuff on the kernel side. Um, like, there's a, I've seen like before when people haven't been able to do it. You've been able to load and uh, like um, file share modules um, or and stuff from inside the container. Um, so like, do you ever want a container to have an NFS share? Probably never. I can't think of a good use case for that. But if you're not protecting yourself, like these things are open. Um, so yeah, if you've got App Armor, you can deny like any of the proc stuff. You can deny um, any of the file stuff. You can have read-only file system. Um, you can have a whole heap of stuff. So like, I did a talk at Container Camp Sydney last year where I demoed the dirty cow vulnerability to get root access inside a container when I wasn't root. Um, and then I applied App Armor, and without patching the container, I stopped myself from doing it because I stopped another process from spawning. I stopped temp running in a temp file system. Um, and like when you think about an exploit, usually more than likely someone else is going to have to spin up a process um, because you're not going to get re remote shell um, or anything like that. Um, so if you're only allowing like single processes to be run, it's going to be super difficult for them to exploit something because they'll, they'll more than likely need to have another process run to be able to execute anything against. I'm not saying that that's 100% the case all the time, um, but I mean, there's nothing 100% secure. Um, we just want to mitigate the risk. Um, so yeah, I, I know I said, shout out to SE Linux and, and, and Setcomp. Um, you, can, you can set this up with either of those. But this is the question I get. Containers still run at root? Uh, yes, they do. Um, and, but it has been um, worked on at the moment. If you have a look at this particular um, um, like project on GitHub, there's a lot of work being done. Um, at the moment, like things like BuildKit have been uh, moved to non-root, so you don't need um, root access anymore to build containers. Um, the main thing at the moment is the networking and how they handle networking and user namespace. Um, it is being worked on at the moment. Um, but if you're interested in the scene, how, and you want to live on the bleeding edge, um, this is where I'd go to find out more information. Um, and big shout out to the two guys that run this. There's like literally two guys that are um, doing this in their own time. Um, so one of them is called, a core maintainer on SUSE and the other one's a core maintainer on like container D and some, some other bits and pieces. Um, and they're really going out there to try to find if they can do this. Uh, Jess Rochelle started a, a, like a, 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 a repo that did like a kind of a POC um, to prove that it is capable, you are capable of doing rootless containers. Um, but then these two guys have really picked it up. So big shout out to them, like it's a lot, whole heap of work that they're doing on the side for everyone um, to make the container ecosystem a better place. Um, but yeah, at the moment, containers run as root, as long as containers run as root, if you do somehow have an exploit to get out, the Docker user or the Docker group's as good as root, so um, just be careful of that. Um, one of the things that I, well, I can say this because I natively use Golang most of the time and it's easy for me to say, um, but I, if I was building an application, I would run static code analysis um, on both my code and the vendor directory. Um, and then I'd have my binary. And because I use Golang, it's easy to say I'll just use Scratch because um, Golang doesn't need anything else. Um, and then I don't have anything else on the OS or the underlying container. Um, that's, again, like super easy to say if it's a compiled language. If you're using something else that's not like JS, um, use Alpine. Um, at least it's cut down, um, and it gives you a lot smaller attack surface. But um, yeah, I would I would definitely use use Scratch if you can, um, because it just there's a whole heap of stuff that's not in there. Okay. Um, 
Do containers allow us to change our security pro profile? Um, I believe, yes, and that was actually interesting in the last, last talk how they were talking about too far left or too far right to find out that you've got an issue. Um, I think containers can push them fairly left, um, and I don't think I actually built a container pipeline that done this back before um, Kubernetes 1.0, um, so in the last job. So this was like a while back, two years ago. Um, and one of the things that we, we were under uh, ISM security, um, so IRAP assessment, um, and one of the things that we had to do was um, get containers securely into the environment through the, um, the deployment. Um, and basically, I built the architecture of how we did RPMs, um, which actually worked better for containers than it did for RPMs. Um, so you can, and because like an RPM still needs a host, um, a container, you can box up and it's everything there. Um, so you can do like all of your security stuff right there. Um, so I actually had this um, on my uh, monitor from the security uh, manager on that particular job. And he was like, InfoSec and DevOps and Sec, this is just you creating a whole heap of mess and just me cleaning it up. And I was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, because I think that both those things can go hand in hand. Um, and they can actually work together really, really well. Um, and actually make either, each other's jobs a lot more easier. Um, so the first thing that we needed to do in a pipeline to deploy the container security was make sure that there was no vulnerabilities. Um, so we use Claire. Um, this, this project's awesome. It's kind of gone a little bit quite since Red Hat acquired CoreOS. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with it. Um, but it was being updated um, fairly regularly. Um, there's some other paid projects you can get, like um, Docker Trusted Registry's got it. Um, the thing I like about Claire, though, is it was an open API, a CLI, um, and then if you're building your own pipeline, you can bolt it in wherever you want. Um, where in, with the paid products with like Docker Tr Trusted Registry, it assumes that you've already deployed the container um, for it to be scanned at rest. Uh, into the registry, which means you can leak it. Um, with Claire, you could go Docker Hub, uh, sorry, Docker File, Checkout, Build, Scan, Stop. Um, so the only server that's got the, the the vulnerable code in it is actually your build server. It has never gone to a registry, so you, there's no there's no way you can leak anything out. Um, so yeah, this is super powerful. Um, so this can show you if you've got anything. So. What you want to look at is two things when you deploy a container. One, that your code's not vulnerable, and there was, as I said, a really good talk about that just before mine, so if you missed that, watch, catch the video or, or whatever you can afterwards. Um, the second one is you want to make sure that nothing you're deploying on the container side is vulnerable. And you, uh, you'll be absolutely surprised if you went out and had a look at library and seen how many vulnerabilities and high vulnerabilities are out there in like, like containers from the library. Um, so. So yeah, so this, this, this will give you the best chance to, to remediate anything like that and stop you from accidentally deploying something that's, that's vulnerable. So here's the workflow, pretty simple. You got Jenkins, Jenkins looking good. Um, vulnerability scan with Claire, and then crypto sign your images. Um, that's a really important thing, um, we'll get to that next. Um, if in any of this pro uh, process, you can either do one of two things, one of three things. You can not care if there's a vulnerability and just have it in the Jenkins log and pipe it somewhere so then you've got a dashboard. Um, you can set preferences on like low, medium, high critical vulnerabilities and stop the job. Um, or you can do both and have an audit trail. Um, so if anyone's under any sort of like assessment and needs an audit trail or builds vulnerabilities and remediation, this build process actually gives you all of that. Um, so you can clearly show that build with number X had a vulnerability in it, the build was stopped. Um, we patched that vulnerability and then build Y has gone through and it's green. So there's your audit, uh, remedi audit remediation documentation straight away. So if you pipe out any of the Jenkins logs, say any of your whatever you like to do, uh, whether it be ALK or anything else, um, you got remediation documentation and, and proof um, through the CD pipeline that you, you are actually looking at um, patching and, and fixing stuff. Um, and what you can actually start to do when you get really good at this is you can run this nightly. Um, so when you get into a good spot with containers, like because it is wrapped up and the container is the application and that's the unit of application, um, you can start to run this automated nightly and then you can, you got, um, you can have automated um, vulnerability remediation 
um, on both your code. Um, so like say, for example, I had a Golang app and I was using vended in X and it was vulnerable and then that system found it was vulnerable. Um, but it said the CVE come back and in the metadata it said like upgrade to this version. We could do an automatic pull request to update it. We could then um, run it through. Um, we could go through that CD process. We could then go through the vulnerability scanning of Claire. Um, we could then go through and deploy to Kubernetes. We can do automated testing and then we can go to production. Like that is possible if you have the right test framework in. Like some people might not be that comfortable, but like with, with containers, you can be super agile. So you can actually do nightly um, vulnerability remediation and have documentation with not a single engineer logged in. And, and that's not theory. I have actually built that system and it works. It works really well. Um, there is always the chance that like you can't fix the vulnerability. So then uh, we'd get a message in Slack in the morning and then they'd say container X is vulnerable. Um, then we'd go back to security and go, well, this is vulnerable. There's no patch to fix it. Um, here, we need to do a risk analysis on whether this is acceptable or not. Um, but that's that's pretty good considering like we've been asleep and we did no work. Um, so we kind of automated ourselves out of a job. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's awesome um, to be able to have the flexibility to do all this on the fly. Um, and to me, that's true DevOps, like having development and um, whether you call it ops or SRE or infrastructure person, um, actually working together for a single, uh, like a, the same outcome. Um, and then having a security team on that, on that. So you have like, I think it's called Sec DevOps now, um, or whatever it is, DevOps. But if you have the security team involved there, um, that's really good. Um, so, you, so you have like three teams working together, like actually, actually being asleep, um, and you can notify them as, and stuff as well. So um, it's super powerful, the, the, what you get from the, the container um, compared to like, before, like in the same environment on a traditional app, we used to deploy it to a staging environment um, and then we'd have to pen test that and then we'd find that like there's a whole heap of stuff going on and then we'd have to redeploy that box or upgrade it. Um, the other thing that we were running sometimes Java apps and then we'd have libraries that were vulnerable in one and we'd update that and break the other app running on Java so we could have no seg um, segmentation. So once we started to split out the, the applications into the smaller units, like it gave us a whole heap of flexibility. Um, now, signing your images. This is super, super important. If you take away one, one thing from this talk today, sign your images. Um, so if you look back at that vulnerable container that, um, that, you, that we saw earlier, um, if you had notary set up and you had only trust from, like even from Docker Hub library and um, your internal registry and someone on a server that counted had this tr tr trust set up and did Docker run that exploitable container, it would pull the image and not execute the process um, because there's no trust to just anyone. You're at, at, that, at that point in time, you're saying, I only trust my registry and I only trust library. If you want to be super sensitive, and what I would recommend would be only trust your registry, fork stuff from library you need, and then run it through the same CD process and, and that we just spoke about with Claire. Um, then you've got full control over like a golden image, if you will, of Docker. And then what you can actually do is start to loop, loop around. Um, so say I'm the SRE person and I'm going, someone comes up to me and goes, I, I need a, a node container. I can have a look in my catalog and say, I've forked the node container from library. I've run my um, like analysis with Claire. I've signed the image. Um, that's good for you to use. Here's the um, like node version one, we'll call it. We're not going to use latest because um, again, that's susceptible if someone actually gets on the box to change what latest is and stuff. But I mean, someone's already on the box at that point. I mean, it's like they can pretty much do what they want anyway. They might, but yeah, I'd, latest is not good. Um, but so, so we've got a crypto signing. We've got to trust that up with the engine. Um, then when they put their application on top, their static code analysis gets done again. Um, we push it through the like SRE pipeline again to see if there's any vulnerabilities come up because like there could be something released from when we run it last night till today. Um, and then we crypto sign it again. Um, why we do that is like it's got a new tag now. Every time the tag changes, you crypto sign it. Um, and the what you would try to do as well is offhand any of the crypto stuff to the security team. Say, I don't want to know about it. Don't want to care about it. Don't want to know the keys. I want to keep the separation of duty completely separate. Let them um, 
put the keys. There's a whole heap of automated systems you can use. You can use like anything to, to set this um, up. Um, so it could be like config management, it could be bash, it could be cloud formation, it could be a whole heap of stuff. Like, doesn't matter. Let them control the security side of it and the, crypt and the cryptography where it's coming from. You don't control that because what that gives you from an audibility po um, point of view is um, separation of duties. So if security gives you crypto, you just look after the signing and the CD process. Everyone's happy, it works really well. Um, so here's some uh, really dry API calls if you care um, about how signing works. So as you can see there, there's this like sign a DB and, and, and things like this. Um, the good thing about Tough and Notary, it's just uh, not just, it's in CNCF now. Um, so it was a Docker project, it's now in CNCF. So you'll see it, this integrated a lot heavily, more heavily into Kubernetes and any of those um, projects, um, which is really, really exciting because I, I started using this when it was like 0.02. Um, zero, zero, 002, um, because like, but basically we were looking for something to crypto sign the images because like, there was no way that we could um, run an RPM from upstream where I was. So like, you couldn't just go yum install from anywhere. It all had to come through our yum repos, that had to be signed. There was a trust set up. I was like, why hasn't anyone thought about this with containers? Um, and I think they had. So yeah, so that's what it is. The other interesting thing is if someone, say that same developer, like has got issues with the, the Nginx um, container that you've given them and they get onto the server and they just go, oh, do you know what? I thought I'm just going to use Nginx from Docker Hub. Um, if you don't have the trust set up for the library, if they go Docker run Nginx, um, it'll download the image again, but it won't spawn it. Um, because at this point, you're forcing them to trust your registry only. Um, you can only do that with Notary. And that's super powerful. You just set it up as, as easy as this. That's um, trust the Docker library. Um, and to do inside your build system, you just do this and that's it. So it's like not a whole heap of steps um, extra it's to, to, to actually get this all working. Um, it's really, really straightforward. Um, there, there used to be really tricky to set up the notary server. It's like super easy now. They've done a lot of work around the UX of that. Um, so yeah. Um, so this is a full deployment pipeline. As you can see there, you run, scan, file, push, uh, cannot run signed image. So that's just a, to highlight what we spoke about. Um, but more than likely, we're, we're still talking about a single node. Um, so let's, let's, let's loop back around and say, well, no one's going to run a single node in production. They're going to run it on most likely Kubernetes because like, that has pretty much run the... Um, orchestration walls, and I'm wearing that shirt today, so we have to talk about it. Um, so runners non root user, simple pod configuration. There it is. That's as basic as it is. Um, Read-only file system, one line. Um, in your build process, when you're deploying uh, any of these YAML files, you can actually like look for these to make sure they're there and, build, uh, and fail a build or a deployment if it's not there. Um, like, so these, this is all like straight out of the box, this single line stuff. Privilege escalation, false. Seems like this stuff should be turned on by default, right? Um, there's a whole talk about this in the Kubernetes project about why it's not turned on by default. Uh, I don't want to get into that now. Um, but look, it's, it's there, like it's better than it not being there. Um, just make sure that you've, you've got it turned on. And as I said, this is all stuff that you can look, someone to play something. Like, I know Kubernetes, the Kubernetes project is like you can control on your laptop and you just send it out, but like more likely than not, in a, in a decent sized environment, you're not going to do that. You're not going to have developers that's going, can control, deploy this, this, this. It's, it's just not going to happen. You're going to have something in like a GitOps workflow, you're going to have something checked in. There's going to be some, some sort of deployment process through Jenkins. And this is where you can like bottle all this in to make sure that like you could fail a build, you've got privilege escalation turned on. They're like, I didn't even know that I, didn't, I needed that. Well, well, that's totally fine, but like you've just shut down something. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like all straight there. Oh, have I gone too far? Sorry. Don't use one, you can use them all. Um, it's not, a, that wasn't an if, or have a read-only file system, or run as user, or um, allow privilege. Um, use them all. 
and I already ruined the Sasha LaBeouf magic. Um, so, like, for very little, you've just, like, dropped the threat um, of someone breaking out of the container by a lot. Like, literally adding three lines in a YAML file um, has allowed a lot of things to stop being happening. So, in a real-world example, um, we built an OS and we're like, okay, that's cool, why did you do that? Um, we wanted to run Kubernetes in containers and run containers only. And, and this is from NIST, another one, this is a barn burner. Uh, if you want to um, have a good Friday night, it's Friday night tonight, get yourself a nice glass of scotch and sit down and read this PDF. But, oh, trust me, you'll, uh, you'll thank me tomorrow. Um, but basically what this is saying is like, uh, if you're going to run containers, you should have a minimalist OS. There's a whole heap of stuff you don't need there, so why have it? Um, so I love this project, Linux Kit. I contributed to this project. Um, we built a whole heap of stuff on top of this. Um, and why we started looking at this, like I'm going to talk a little bit about Puppet here, um, but I was on a project where we were building like the PE um, AWS image. It took three hours. I was like, Jesus, three hours? Nothing takes three hours. Um, the reason was we were installing PE, we ran security over it, we uninstalled the, pa the packages we didn't need, we ran security again, um, then we signed it and then we sent it to AWS. Um, and that was using Packer and it was super fragile. Like if any of the, the moon didn't align and the, the wind was blowing the wrong way and something happened there in the second round of security scanning, gone, three hours back to the beginning. I actually had one dev then I was like, how many builds did you do today? Oh, I've got one full one out and we were close on the second. Like, that's, like, we, we, we live in a CD sort of world. That's unacceptable, one build a day. Like, and then that's, that's just for development. We weren't even releasing it at that stage. That's so he can get to the next stage of his development. Um, so I like this. Um, big shout out to the guys at Docker that made this. Um, it's in the same repo now. There's over 100 contributors from 100 different companies now. Uh, so the likes of Microsoft, IBM. Um, if you have a look at Microsoft running the LCAL project, which is Linux containers on Windows, this is all built on Linux Kit. Um, so there's a lot of big, big people backing it. Um, but what does it give you? It gives you like a Lean OS, it, just the kernel. Um, you can actually put any kernel you want in there. Um, just, and this is kernel from upstream, like so Travatas kernel, whatever, I can't even remember the repo, but yeah, it's no Franken kernel like Red Hat, I'm gonna say bad about Red Hat again. I hope this is not recorded, people at Red Hat can hate me. But like 3.10.1.867, this massive hash patch Franken kernel. It's actually the, the proper kernel. Um, this allows you to run any container runtime, so you don't have to run Docker. You can run ContainerD and GVisor. Um, you could run Kata containers out in ContainerD if you want. Um, there's a whole heap of stuff you could do. I mean, Kata containers would be hard to run on Linux Kit because you need another virtualization layer, but like it could it could work. Um, batteries are included, but can be replaced. So what we're talking about, like. The one thing that Linux Kit gives you is uh, use namespaces and be able to sandbox every application into its own namespace. So even if you break out, you're only in that namespace. Um, and then trying to escape that namespace, you need to have a vulnerability in the kernel. Um, so that is the main reason why we went with this. Because like, if we're going to deploy this onto um, customer environments, um, we want to make sure that the security profile was like top notch. Um, not saying that, that this is like impenetrable, but like from the tests and third parties that we've had look at it, it's like pretty difficult. Um, so specialized patch configurations. And the other thing is that you can build this the same way that I told. Uh, so imagine if you could build an OS through GitOps workflow. Um, so if you had the like Claire and everything that I spoke about before, but build a whole OS, you can do it with Linux Kit. It's a YAML file. Um, you can see there it's got the trust from up, up there as the hash from the public notary. You can put your notary in there. Um, you can define your OS. You can define um, like the Run C version. You can define any, everything you want. You can run the static code analysis over there. You can scan those um, those containers. So everything that we did before, and then build an OS. Um, this is this is super super powerful. Um, yeah, I I can't speak more highly of this at all. So yeah, I was that was me when I first did it. I was like, spoke to one of the guys that did it. I was like, yeah, it's a bit hobbyist and like, 
like, who's going to actually use this? And then I used it. I was like, damn, I was wrong. Then I went, I went back to like senior people at Puffin and said, hey, I've got this idea. And they're like, Linux kid, who uses that? And I was like, trust me. And then I showed them and they were like, oh, that's pretty good. Um, because like the whole, it's the whole thing that like we've been told that like you just use an OS, you build an application, it runs on top of it. Um, but what happens if there's a disruption to that? Like there's a whole heap of stuff on OSs that we don't need. I mean, again, back in the last talk, um, they were talking about like 90% of your application is like components or like vendoring in stuff. Um, and then 10% is your code. Well, then think about the OS underneath that. I mean, at KubeCon, I think someone was talking about that and they were like, it's 10 million lines of code before you even install Kubernetes. Um, do we need all that? Um, if you're only going to run containers as well. Um, something we've built, so like that's just not um, something that's all theoretical. We have actually built an application using this. Um, we built Cream. Um, any Wu Tang fans out there? Uh, Cream stands for Kubernetes rules everything around me. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. That's me and Dave are massive Wu Tang fans. Um, so basically, there's a Linux kit Im image. We use Container D. Um, we use Kubelet, and we have an application called Bootstrap, which is a Golang um, application that talks gRPC over the Unix socket. And the Cream client at the moment is just a stub for what would be an upstream application passing configuration to Bootstrap that allows it to configure Kubelet. Um, so there is, and, and this is all built in containers. This is all using the same notary, but we've ripped out all of the OS and we've ripped out, that's all it runs. So it literally runs an init system a kernel, bootstrap and kubelet. Um, it's, less than, it's less than a gig and it boots up in about 45 seconds. Um, and it's got to pull the control plane the first time, so depending on internet connection. Um, bootstrap itself is totally immutable. Um, there's no file system that it writes to. Um, it passes everything out through the interface on container D for logging. Um, Kubelet has got a, a volume mount in, in the cloud that is writable. Obviously, you need the control plane to run somewhere. Um, and if we needed to do an upgrade of this in the cloud, we can actually just replace the whole image over the EBS volume and remap it. Um, and that works so far so good with the Kubernetes version. Um, so, yeah, and the etcd versions that we've had so far, we're being successful with it. Um, Bootstrap understands that, that mount volume and understands what's running there and the, the mounts that's there, so like the etcd volume and data and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, if you put all those things that we spoke about in place today, I need to go to the ultimate of building um, uh, an OS with it. I ask you, is it that easy to break out a container? If you, if you use all of the tools and um, build a supply chain um, and you mitigate all those things that we spoke about, would it be that hard for you to do? And like, this is just adding a second Linux image to um, a, as a Kubernetes worker. Um, so in this instance, the Bootstrap understands, gets past the IP range, whitelists it, there's SSL traffic across it. Once Bootstrap's finished, because it does admin um, operations, it um, actually just destroys itself and exits once the Kubernetes cluster is up and running. Um, so if you want to learn more about that particular project, I actually did a talk about it uh, a week ago <laughs> at Puppetize Live, um, and it's open source, so you can go and watch it. I'll speak in more detail about the security and why we did it, um, why, didn't, why, why we didn't run Puppet, um, about more about the like, namespaces, using C groups to control what, what can learn, load and, and a whole heap of, heap of stuff like that. So that's the other thing I forgot to mention in, in great detail is like you can control um, with C groups like what's running in the different sandboxes. Um, so you've got fine grained control over um, different bits and pieces and you can also um, include your app armor and, and whatnot in it. Um, some more interesting reading, if you're really interested in like kernel level security, um, read the horizontal attack profile um, of a container. That, that's super interesting. It actually looks at like Carter containers, um, Docker, um, and some other runtimes. And it looks at like the benefits of not, not only like the security profile, but then the overhead of running a VM and a container. Um, so it looks at like um, what, what risks do you have compared to what performance hits you get. And there's a whole heap of stuff. Um, then there's Jess Brazel's blog about um, containers as well. That's, that's a really good one. Um, so with that, the question I actually have is for you. Um, how, how easy do you think at the end of the stock it is if you don't have stupid configurations like Mr. Morrison um, to break out of a container? 
I haven't seen it. As I said, I've got a few friends in Twistlock and, and, and bits and pieces like that. Uh, they haven't actually seen it yet in the wild, only in researchers that have already got access and, and stuff set up. Um, so I'd be interested to hear if anyone's got a story of it happening in the wild or any questions about everything I spoke about. I understand there was a bit of topic there. So if not, just, yeah, you can hit me up on Twitter or anything else if you want. Do we have any questions before we... Thanks, Carl. Running out of caffeine? <laughs> Thank you, round of applause. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.